and okay let's go so um in in this discussion i am going to go through homework six and um let's just read through the, the homework in this homework we're basically given a transfer function a second order system stable second order system and um, we would like to change the characteristics of that system in order to satisfy certain transient um, uh, transient requirements, transient response requirements, and also steady state error requirements. We want to do that in two ways. The first way, um, which we went, um, which we went through before in the previous discussion, by basically designing a lead lag um, compensator. And then the second way, way is um, using a, a PI, a P D and then a PID uh, controller design. So let's go ahead and proceed with the first method. Um, we are given this transfer function and the transit requirements we'd like to satisfy is that we would like an underdamped second order system with a natural frequency of five reds per second and a zeta of 0.8. Um, and to proceed, uh, first, we will design a lead compensator. Um, and recall that the lead compensators are used to satisfy the transient characteristics. When we design using the root locus method, a lead compensator is used to satisfy the transient characteristics of a transfer function. So um, let's first find the, uh, the transient characteristics or the characteristic polynomial for the dominant pole pair that we would like to have, which is s squared plus two zeta um, omega n, s plus omega n squared. When we substitute with 0.8 and five, you get um, two times 0.8 times five, which is eight, eight s here. This is two zeta omega n and omega n squared, which is 25. So the roots are basically um, negative zeta omega n plus or minus omega n square root one minus zeta square, which will be negative four plus or minus three i. The lead compensator consists of, um, or in order to design a lead compensator, we need to design um, or to pick values for three parameters. The gain k, um, the location of the zero, z1, and the location of the pole. And recall that for a For a lead compensator, we need Z1, the absolute value of that is less than P1. This is for a lead compensator. And so um, at the beginning of the lead uh, compensator design, there is an arbitrary step that we said we place the zero directly below the dominant or the um, desired dominant uh, pole pair location. In this case, it's negative four because our dominant poles have negative four plus or minus three i. And so uh, this means that we picked the first parameter, which is z1. Uh, so now we have the, um, the, the numerator of the lead compensator. The next step um, is uh, or after this arbitrary step where we choose the zero below the, um, the desired root characteristics, we need to, in order for the root locus to pass through this point, we need to satisfy the characteristic equation for the closed loop system um, by satisfying both the magnitude and uh, the phase requirement. The phase requirement will give us the location of the pole and the magnitude requirement will give us the gain. So uh, first we compute the, um, the characteristic uh, equation or the, uh, the characteristic polynomial of the uh, closed loop system, which is delta S. It's one plus GC times G, um, which we, we substitute with the expressions we have, we get this. This equals to zero means that we need to satisfy um, 
but it, basically if we just move the one around, uh, we can put this as zero, we can put a negative one here. So basically we need to satisfy this equation, right? So if you take uh, the phase of both sides, the phase of negative um, one is either negative 180 or 180. It doesn't matter because there's usually plus or minus 360 degrees um, times n, where n is chosen so as to get something in inside that range uh, from zero to 360. Um, so uh, again, the, we apply the uh, rules that we know for manipulating um, expressions of complex numbers when we compute the phase. The phase of this expression it is uh, it translates to the phase of this. We note that the phase of the gain is zero, so it does not account for anything. The phase of the pole, um, we don't know yet, so we're just gonna put it theta p for now. Then we have the phase of the factor s plus three and the factor s plus one, each with a negative sign because they appear in the denominator. We evaluate everything at um, s equal to negative four plus three i. This will give us um, the, uh, because we require the root locus to pass through uh, this uh, desired location. We want everything to be equal. We, so we want all of that to be equal to negative 180 degrees. And so uh, if we just move the 180, we get 270 here, and then we get minus the phase after we substitute with negative four plus three. So negative four plus three, that's negative one plus three i. This is the first fraction. And then the second fraction, which is um, negative four plus three, plus one, that's negative three plus three i. <clears throat> this is the, um, the second factor. And then uh, we moved theta to the other side. So you get that theta p is gonna be equal to this expression, which will turn out to be approximately 26.56 degrees. Now, uh, this we said is gonna be equal to the phase of the factor of the pole. So if we substitute with s equal to negative four plus three i in uh, the expression for the uh, pole of the uh, lead compensator, you get it's gonna be equal to the phase of this fact of this expression, which is equal to the tan inverse of three divided by negative, um, and then we open the parentheses, uh, four plus p1, where p1 is the unknown we take the 10 of both sides, you get that 10, 26.56 is equal to three divided by negative uh, four plus pi. And it's important to keep track of the uh, sign signs here, like do not switch the signs because um, this tan inverse is supposed to be the tan that takes into account the, the, um, the quarter, right, of the angle. Um, so 10, 26.56, it's gonna be equal to one half. Um, and if you, like if we switch basically, like if we divide both, um, if we do this simple multiplication and then simplify, you will get that um, P1 is gonna be equal to negative 10, which implies that we found the second factor or the second parameter of our lead design, which is S equal to 10. So now we have the location of the, the zero, the location of the pole. We're only missing the gain. Now it just becomes a, an easy uh, substitution where we basically um, have to satisfy that everything, um, the, the K is equal to the magnitude of all of this, evaluated at the pole, the desired pole location, negative four plus three I. Um, if you do the substitution, you will get that this is going to be equal to the, uh, equal to 30. Now, so now this completes the design process for the lead compensator. So the lead compensator turns out to be 30 times S plus four divided by S plus 10. Any questions? 
Okay. So after this, so this um, this lead camp consider uh, helps us satisfy the transient requirements, or basically it guarantees that the root locus will pass through the desired dominant pole locations. The next uh, step is that we would like to design a lag compensator in order to satisfy steady state error requirements due to a step input. Um, and uh, the solution uh, or the design process after we have designed the lead compensator or if we do not want to do any modifications to the uh, transit requirements is basically we compute the required gain increase. So first we compute the gain of the open loop system. <coughs> Without the lead compensator, in this case, it's going to be K equal to UN. This is the uncompensated system. Um, and it's going to be equal to 30 times. Uh, we substitute basically with S equal to zero inside the expression for the uh, transfer function. So you get four divided by 10 times three times one. Um, you, get, you can see that three times 10 cancels with 30 and you get four, right? So the gain of the uncompensated system is equal to four. Now let's compute the steady state error requirement. We know that the steady state is going to be equal to the limit. The absolute value of the limit at s goes to zero of one over one plus gs times gs. And um, let me remind you that this comes from the expression of the error. So, uh, one, two. This is basically s times e of s. After some simplifications. And so this is the absolute value of one plus Kc, where Kc is the required gain uh, increase. We want that to be less than or equal to 0.1, which implies that Kc has to be bigger than nine. Um, and so, so basically we require a gain increase of nine over four, which is 2.25. Um, this ratio will be equal to the ratio between the zero of the um, of the lag compensator and the pole of the lag compensator, because uh, oh, okay. So let me write the the form here. A lag compensator is basically um, a lag compensator is S plus Z two. S plus P2, or, sorry, minus, minus, doesn't matter. It's just a convention. So as I was saying, um, we set that to be the ratio between Z2 and P2. Um, since, since we have the, the dominant poles lie at negative four, right um the rule of the thumb is that we set uh, zero to be equal to the real part of the dominant poles divided by 50 and then uh, if we do that you get um that we will place the zero of the uh, lag compensator at negative o uh, eight and so because we have a fixed ratio here we can uh, immediately compute p2 going to be equal to that divided by 2.25, which will give 0.036 approximately. This completes the design process for the uh, lag compensator. And so the total compensator or the cascade of a lead and lag compensator gives us the lead lag compensator, which consists of the lead that we designed earlier, and then the lag that satisfies the steady state requirements. Now it's just a, as a just as a direct uh, computation, if you try to compute the ESS using the, mm, the final value theorem, you will get uh, the required the result that we wanted to have, which is that the steady state error is less than 0.1. Um, after we're done with all the problems, we're going to go to uh, MATLAB and we're going to check all of these design requirements, but let me just move on to um, the third
part of our problem today, which is basically that we would like to design a PD controller for our system so that the dominant roots are the same as above. And so uh, because this is a simple system, we can do the design analytically. Um, a, a PD controller consists of a gain KP, we call it the proportional term, and then a derivative term, um, the KD term, right? And it's multiplied by S um, and S basically represents the derivative. Like if you, if you multiply S times a signal X, it gives you the derivative of that signal. And so the controller basically has a proportional term and a derivative term. So uh, when we compute the closed loop transfer function, given um, that we, we have not yet specified the values of KP and KD, but we will compute the expression of the transfer function anyways, it's going to be equal to KD times S plus KP in the, numerator, in the numerator. And then in the denominator, you have S squared plus 4S plus 3 plus KDS plus KP. You collect the terms. This gives you the characteristic polynomial of the transfer function, um, of the closed loop transfer function in terms of the parameters KP and KD. So, um, we would like this characteristic equation to be the same as the characteristic equation that we found from our desired dominant uh, pole locations. This gives us an equation in terms of KP and AD that we can solve um, in order to get the values. So you have, uh, you have here 4 plus KD must be equal to 8. So this immediately gives us that um, KD should be equal to four. And then the second equation, which is KP plus three must be equal to 25. This gives us the second equation um, somewhere here. Yeah, which gives that KP should be equal to 22. And so the compensator, the PD compensator is for 22. Now, the, what enabled this analysis was that the original transfer function was uh, quite simple, right? Excuse me. Um, the original transfer function was quite simple. It was a second order system and we're using a single um, PD controller. And so the, we could actually compute the closed loop transfer function easily in terms of the parameters KP and KD. And then solving for those parameters becomes basically um, a coefficient matching, like uh, matching the coefficients of uh, two polynomials. Um, the next problem is that we would like to design a PID controller to satisfy the dominant uh, pole locations. And simultaneously, we would like to satisfy a steady state error that is less than 0.1. Um, so this might be a little bit um, different. There are different ways to go at this. However, the way that I will follow here is by doing the following. First, instead of, um, so in the traditional way that we do uh, things, we go first after the, um, after satisfying the transient requirements and then going after the steady state error, right? That's what we did when we designed the lead lag compensator. Here, we're gonna do the opposite. We will first um, design for the steady state error in order to find the gain um, KI, and then after we find the gain KI, we will solve for the gains KP and KD so that the dominant pole locations of the closed loop system will have the desired pole locations that we had earlier. So first, let me just explain the structure of a PID controller. PID controller consists of the traditional PD controller where we have KP and KD, but then there's this term the uh, integral term, which contains one over S multiplied with a gain KI and one over S is, um, as you know, it's basically the integration. So um, if we just factor one over S out, you get a second order polynomial 
inside, which um, has the free term ki and the rest, and then kp times s and then kd times s squared. So again, if we <clears throat> if we try to compute the transfer function t of s, t of s is going to be equal to um, again we, we can just take the numerator or so this. Again, it's going to be equal to n of s, d of s plus n of s. <clears throat> One second. All right. So, um, so uh, when we do that computation, we get this polynomial expression here, which uh, after you collect the terms, you get a third order polynomial. Coefficient of S cubed is going to be equal to one. Then you have four plus KD times S squared. And then you have three plus KP times S. And then you have the free term KI. Um, and recall for a type one system, right? Because now when we add this pole at the origin in the open loop system, this system immediately becomes a type one system. And so um, the error for uh, the, the steady state error, okay, so before we proceed, can someone tell me what is the steady state error due to a step input for a um, first order system? Uh, not for a first order system, for a type one system. Any ideas? Zero? Yes, it's zero, exactly. Um, but it has a finite um, steady state error due to a ramp input, right? And we would like to make that um, to be less than 0.1. So um, recall that the steady state error due to ramp input of a, um, of a type one system is equal to one over KV, where KV is the velocity error constant, right? And uh, KV um, is equal to the limit as S goes to zero of S times the open loop transfer function. Um, the open loop transfer function, we computed it over here. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, the open loop transfer function is just um, k of uh, g, gc of s, right, which is the P, PIE controller, and then g of s, which is just one over s plus three divided by s, uh, sorry, times s plus one. And so uh, the s cancel the s here cancels with the one over s that we had from the controller. So these basically cancel with each other and we get, uh, then we substitute basically with s equal to zero. And the expression you get is gonna be equal to ki divided by three. So if we would like the steady state error to be less than or equal to 0.1, this means that we, would, that we need uh, ki to be um, three divided by ki to be less than or equal to 0.1, which implies that we need ki to be equal to uh, bigger than or equal to 30, okay? So um, now that we have made um, a design or that we have the requirement over steady state error, we just need to satisfy the steady state error requirements and having this ki will make us, uh, will help or will make this process easier. And we notice that when we close the loop with the parameters that we have for KP and KD, uh, we see that we obtain a third order polynomial. And so in order to satisfy the studies, uh, the transit requirements, we are gonna follow the dominant pole um, approach and we're gonna, um, we're gonna basically match the coefficients with this third order polynomial. And so to do so, we're gonna add a third Pole, which represents the additional pole that um, that governs the uh, uh, it, it represents the additional pole that governs the 
uh, or that makes the system a third order system, right? After the two dominant pole pairs have been chosen. And so, uh, and we have our transient requirements, right? Yeah, we've already translated them above into a second order polynomial. And so when we carry out the multiplications, you get this expression for the closed loop um, transfer function uh, where we have sigma as an, as an unknown and we will match the coefficients of this transfer function or of this characteristic polynomial with the coefficients of um, the closed loop transfer function with the parameters kp, kd, and ki. This, so this is what we did here. All right. And so in order for these uh, for these uh, to be equal to each other, the, the mutual or the, the like power coefficients must match, which means that we need ki to be equal to um, 25 times sigma, right? Which implies that we need, uh, if, if we pick, so, okay, so there's a requirement on ki to be bigger than or equal to 30. Nothing prevents me from saying, from saying that ki is gonna be equal to 50, right? I can choose it whatever I want. So I'm gonna put it to 50. This, uh, so 50 equal to 25 means that sigma is gonna be equal to two. And then the next coefficient is that sigma plus eight must be equal to four plus kd. This means that uh, since sigma is equal to two, this must be equal to 10, which implies when we move the four to the other side, we get kd equal to six. Uh, and then the last equation, we have eight sigma plus 25 must be equal to the corresponding coefficients. Uh, where did it go? Oh, sorry. Three plus kps must be equal to eight sigma plus 25. If we substitute with two, you get 16 plus 25, that's 41. So you need 41. Um, you need three plus kp to be equal to 41, which implies that kp is going to be equal to 38. Now, uh, now we have the value for kd and we have the value for kp. And we've already chosen the value for ki to be equal to 50. This will give us that our controller is going to be equal to this expression here. Any questions so far? Okay, now let's try to uh, compute all these, or um, yeah, let's try to check all of these designs on uh, MATLAB and see uh, what each one, on, each one of them has to offer. So let me share my screen. Let's create a new tab. As usual, we start with our um, traditional preamble as equal to this, and then we have G is going to be equal to S plus three, S plus one. Then uh, let's try the first controller. Let's call it GC1. It's going to be the lead lag computer that we designed. And it was 30 times um, 
s plus 4 divided by s plus 10, then we have s plus 0.08 divided by s plus 0.036. So this is the um, this is the lead compensator that we had before. Let's have a look at the root locus of that, or locus of G C one times G. Let's run this. So uh, clearly, as you can see, we have here, look at the gain. We see at the gain of one with this transfer function, we get uh, what we wanted that the pole is was at a, uh, negative four plus 3.07. Uh, this um, small deviation is, can someone tell me what, why there is this uh, small uh, deviation? from the exact value of negative four plus three, right? Is it from the lag compensator? Yeah, exactly, because we added the lag here. Um, this lag will distort the root locus slightly, but not too much. Uh, very good. Okay, let's keep that here. First, let me do figure one, then set plot two and one, one, no, one of one, two, one. Then our locus. I'm going to do another set plot uh, one, two, and two. Now let's look at the uh, second controller we designed, which was the PID controller, which was um, thing 38 plus 6 times s plus 50 divided by s. And let's look at This is two. Our locus of GC two times G. Okay, so we see that clearly there's a significant um, difference between the two um, root loci. Let's look at uh, what happens at gain at gain equal to one here. So this is gain equal to negative, right? So a gain equal to one. A gain equal to one. We got our Whole, uh, whole location to be at um, negative four plus three i exactly. And I'm guessing, yeah, it's probably a numerical error. Should We should be able to get there exactly. Uh, yeah, so I gain equal to one. The pole, we see that the pole is exactly equal to negative four point um, plus three i. Right, so this is the dominant, um, the dominant pole location. However, we can't really say dominant now because we have this, right? We have this pole. We don't know what this pole is doing here. Like, um, like a gain equal to one. The pole is actually going to be equal to negative two, which is not negligible, right? This pole is is definitely not negligible with respect to the pole at negative four. 
And so we can see that um, uh, this is a this like we cannot neglect this pool. It's no it's no longer uh, negligible. It's going to affect the transient response of um, the system. Of course, uh, also we have another like we have a couple of zeros here. We have this zero here and this zero there. So it's definitely not going to be exactly equal, or the response is going to be different from um, the dominant pool locations. But again. Can, can someone suggest to me from, from the equations that we had earlier, uh, something that we can do to uh, try to push um, this uh, pull a little bit further? If this third pull, we wanna push it a little bit further to the, um, to the left. Would you just be adding a lead compensator? Um, to the PID? We can, yeah, that, that's, well, we can do that, but um, I doubt that they will be able to change. Uh, like, I, I cannot see right now what, what it would do to this um, lonely uh, pole here after we add uh, the lead compensator. Uh, what I had in mind was, let me share the screen back. What I had in mind is that uh, this equation tells us that Ki was equal to 25 sigma, right? And so um, sigma, which is the location of the third pole, if you want to push it further, we have to increase Ki, right? So. What happens if we make Ki equal to, um, let's say, 2500, right? That will make sigma equal to 10, 250, sorry. This will make, this will make sigma equal to 10, which implies that, um, which implies that three plus KP is gonna be equal to 80, right? It's gonna be equal to 105, which means that KP is gonna be equal to 102. And um, this 10, I'm gonna turn this to 18, which means that KD is gonna be equal to 14. Right. So now let's uh, check these new design parameters and see what happens. So if we put this 102, and this 14, and this 250, you got a feeling this is not going to look good, but let's see. Okay. No. Very terrible, but so um, we see now that there's a significant uh, change in the root locus, right? If we look at the gain equal to one, okay, gain equal to one, for some reason it jumps it, but you see that it, it passes through here like at 0.98 it basically passes through negative 4.3 um, right and so this looks like a good design so let's um let's try now and look at the transient characteristics of these two and see what happens ouch sorry so let's look at the step response. Let's first compute the closed loop of both of them. Feedback. Oh, can you please switch to uh, the MATLAB screen? Oh, 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 sorry. Yeah, I, I totally forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. Let me stop sharing here and share back here. Yeah. So, uh, so I changed the parameters to uh, 
as I was saying, I, see, I made KP equal to 100 and, um, let's see, 102, right? Is that or is it something else? Let me check. Yeah, 102. And then KD is 14 and um, KI is 250, right? And so I'm just going to recompute uh, the plot. So you see that there's a drastic change of the root locus, right, from uh, from previously, from or from the previous parameters that we had. And also we see that a gain equal to one, uh, which is even further back here, a gain equal to one, the, the, uh, the, the third pole is significantly further away, right? And so uh, its effect is probably going to be negligible on um, the system. However, we still have these two zeros, which will have non-negligible um, effect on our on our um, response. But you know, there's not much we can do here anyway, at least not with the design tools that we have. So uh, now let's look at the closed loop response of both of these systems. We have the lead lag, comp the lead lag so compensator and the PID controller and see what each one of them has to offer. So this is feedback of GC1 times G1. C2, this is step T1, T2, 10 seconds. And let's compute. All right. So, we compute that. So in figure two, what was the order? So we step T1 first, which is the lead uh, lag compensator. GC1 is the lead lag compensator and GC2 is the um, PID controller. See that um, the PID controller, first of all, is able to achieve the desired uh, or basically achieve steady state uh, error of zero in like almost two seconds, right? We also see that, um, let's look at the settling time. The, uh, we already had the steady state, the peak response. We see that um, the overshoot is 13%, uh, whereas for our second system, which does not seem to appear here for some reason, but anyways, Okay. Uh, step T1 for 10 seconds. Step T2 for 10 seconds. Run. Okay. So we see that this um, the uh, the system with the uh, lead lag compensation takes a very long time. Make sure it does not appear here. So let me uh, try to increase this uh, time a little bit. Let's make it 100. 100. Well, yeah, maybe 50. Or 50. Yeah. Okay. So if we compute the settling time, the settling time for this system is, well, very far. It's 23 seconds, right? And um, it takes a long time in order to reach its uh, steady state value, whereas um, our system, the PID controller, reaches in. Right? We have a very low settling time, right? We have a settling time of less than 0.7 seconds. And we have not a very bad peak response, right? So clearly, the PID system shows superior um, superior performance compared to the lead lag compensator design.
um, even though they pass through, or even though the, what we call the dominant pool locations passes through the same uh, dom dominant pools, right? Now let's try to look at the steady state error of the uh, PID system, which we can compute by doing using the function impulse. And then uh, we wanted to look at the um, the ramp input, right, which is one over s square, and then minus one over s square times t two, right. I want to impulse that for 10 seconds and let's let's compute that in a figure three. Run. Mm. We see that um, the the uh, the steady state error has this initial transit response, but then settles down to a value that is approximately approximately 0.01, which is definitely less than the 10% that we uh, that was in the requirement, right? So, um, yeah, that's pretty much all I have for us today. Um, it, does anyone have any questions? All right, you guys, thank you for your attention. Let me know if uh, anything comes up. Um, all right, thank you, Mahmoud. You're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. Bye.